Welcome to another video from AV Forums. On the 25th of April, we attended a launch event at London's Mayfair for the new Bowers & Wilkins Formation Suite of Products. We caught up with Andy Kerr from the company to find out more. So we're here to launch uh, the Formation Range. The Formation Range of Products is something we've been working on for more than three years. Uh, we're very proud of it. It's a completely new wireless platform, first and foremost, which we refer to as the Formation Wireless Mesh. Uh, that enables then a whole series of wireless active products to be built out. The suite that we're launching here today is a five products, and then we're going to be building onwards from there. So what makes your approach to this wireless speaker um, side of the market different from the thousands of other products that are out there at the moment? Very good question. Two things. First and foremost, we focused on developing the wireless platform ourselves. So if you look at what the majority of consumers out there are able to buy right now, it's from an off-the-shelf solution. Most of the providers out there are using one of the key well-known platforms and then adapting it to suit their own needs. Nothing wrong with that approach. Uh, we, however, felt that some of the systems out there were in some way, shape or form compromised from an acoustic performance point of view. One of the key things that we had to focus on was on synchronisation, wireless synchronisation, not just between spaces, but between left and right loudspeakers. Clearly, Bowers & Wilkins has a knowledge or a reputation of stereo sound, so we wanted to focus on delivering high-quality stereo synchronisation left to right. Now, even the best systems we felt they couldn't do the job to the standards that we wanted. So we spent a long time developing that. A long time, the actual synchronization, it's also about stability and quality of service. So lots of work gone into uh, optimizing in our antenna performance, internal antenna performance, making sure the system behaves correctly at all times, uh, and at the same time, obviously, maximizing the ability to use multi-rooms if you want to. There's two different products sections here. You've got your audio two-channel and so on, and you've also got the AV mm -hmm. angle. So let's start with the AV angle. That's what our members are going to be interested in. Uh, as soon as the, the news was broken on, on Monday about the, the formation um, products, one of the first questions was, where's the HDMI? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, HDMI, obviously a long-term, very interesting one for us, particularly EARC. Uh, what we've looked at at the moment with the current HDMI is, well, we don't think we're going to get any tremendous performance advantages relative to using the optical input. We also took some feedback from our, particularly our US market, one of our largest markets, and their preference at that time was clearly expressed around optical. Uh, we've included optical support with uh, an IR blaster, an IR repeater and learner. So that functionality that you get uh, via HDMI ARC in terms of instantaneous use of the product, instant startup, the ability to use the same remote and all that kind of stuff is basically replicated anyway, so you don't lose any functionality. And in terms of audio and audio pass through, well, anything that goes into a television set is inevitably almost uh, kind of reliant on whatever the television set can do, unless you're talking about EARC. So we don't lose a great deal. Um, and in the meantime, from the point of view of functionality, it works just as well. Now, you're mentioning EARC. You've said a couple of times during your presentation here that you're always looking at the market and looking where things are going. So if someone buys the sound bar now, mm -hmm and you bring in EARC in six to 12 months, mm -hmm. what does that consumer get? Well, okay, it's not in terms of feature or in terms of the, the current product? In, in terms of the current product. Well, the current product as it stands today won't support it. Clearly it can't. I mean, it's an optically enabled component. So if we were going to implement EARC, we'd be looking to do that in the next generation of products. It's more a case of being aware of what's out there. As we uh, have touched on EARC, we're very interested in, but at the same time, we're aware at the moment it's an emerging technology. When it's become a more stable technology and it's available across a broad range of products, then we think clearly it's the way forward for a whole series of reasons, not the least of which it gives you access to the higher quality audio running through your TV set. This is all working wirelessly as well. Mm -hmm. So another obvious question our members are going to come up with is, you've got three channels in the sound bar. Mm -hmm. What about adding surround channels and so on? Is that on the radar? Very much so. That's actually a much more straightforward thing to do uh, and something that we're hoping to get done uh, within the course of the next 12 months, if not slightly sooner. So uh, the platform actually has, uh, or pardon me, the bar specifically, has its own uh, 5.1 decoder on board. We've designed it as a hard left, center, right. So it's got the ability to do the 3.1 element if you were to add the base. Uh, but obviously, yes, the surround channels, the 5.1, uh, we can do that too. We just don't want you to do it with the current suite of products that we're launching at the start. Bear in mind, we're launching five products at one time, and that's quite a substantial amount to get through in one hit. Um, so we focused on trying to address as many use cases, as you, if you like, as we can with that one, that one group of products. Uh, you'll be familiar, or you might know, the, the premium stereo pair, the product we call the Duo. Um, we don't want that to be used as the rear channel with the bar. That would be you know, extravagant and probably not an acoustically sound match. So it's more a case of releasing another product, which we hope to do very soon, which will be able to address that need. Okay, and before we go into the products in, in greater detail, I want to try and get the AV stuff out of the way first for, mm -hmm. for our members. You just mentioned the Duo. Again, it's a wireless system. Is there anything stopping someone building a 5171 system based on those? Well, right now, the thing would be some form of decode content to get to it. So it doesn't have any Dolby Digital decoder on board. It's not required, unlike the bar, which does. 
Um, so at the moment, no, it wouldn't be something you could do. Going forward, it may be something that we will enable, but it would be requiring a, a Dolby Digital and you would imagine other forms of high bitrate audio, um, higher bitrate audio uh, decode capability within. So we have a separate standalone product called the Audio, but again, that's focused towards audio only sources. So that has inputs for analog and digital, uh, but that's for the kind of 16-bit uh, content that you're talking about in the standard stereo space, not the 5.1 content you'd be talking about in the surround space. Okay, we've talked a little bit, I've jumped ahead of myself, but I know what the questions are going to be straight away, so let's wind things back to the five products that are being launched. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the bar and the base and, and talk about them a little bit. So both of those are designed to be the highest performance thing that we can give um, for multiple use cases. So not just from a, a, a movie context, but also from a stereo music use case as well. So the bar has been deliberately designed to have a reasonably tall profile at the front. Uh, that, we think, gives it the opportunity to have more uh, conventional drive units, if you like, without the kind of... Uh, if you like constraints that come in for having a shallower form factor. So it's got the same mid-base driving it as you'd find inside the Bowers and Wilkins M1, if you're familiar with that product. Obviously a very successful satellite product that was used for many years and still is used for many years in context in 5.1. Uh, tweeter is shared with a 600 series, so it's the decoupled double dome aluminium tweeter. So the raw, the raw ingredients, if you like, are, are reasonably high performance raw ingredients and give it the opportunity to actually image, to actually create its own sense of stereo presentation, stereo separation, and actually have some presence in the mid-range area, crucial presence. Uh, as I'm sure you know, I'm sure your members know, a lot of subwoofers, particularly ones that are reliant on subwoofers for their low frequency extension, they're very good at the high notes, they're very good perhaps at the bass notes, but where they suffer is that presence in that dynamic area in the mid-range, and that's what we try to avoid with this particular product. Also, the fact that it's configured in this way, that it's got driving its wide space to the wide left and to the wide right gives you that very good sense of stereo image and spaciousness that we wouldn't get otherwise but it's still got a hard center and that's very important too from the point of view of dialogue lock coherence intelligibility clarity so we're very pleased with the bar and you could if you so chose use it as a standalone device just to play music now in fact some cases some of the design might kind of remind you of the zeppelin and some of the elements of it are quite similar for exactly that reason if you want more output from it, you can partner it wirelessly to the base. Uh, the base is, again, probably a familiar design to a lot of your, lot of your guys, because it's kind of closely related to the thinking that we had in the DB series and, of course, prior to that in the PV series. So it's a dual opposed or a force cancellation subwoofer with two back-to-back -back drive units uh, arranged to radiate outwards uh, and kind of working in concert to kind of force cancel any unwanted vibration or energy moving through the structure. Now, why do that? Well, first off, producing a cleaner, kind of more accurate, more articulate sound because we're wasting this energy kind of resonating the cabinet. And second, we're seeing much more able to get a kind of effective integration between the subwoofer and the speakers. Now, we deliberately designed the subwoofer as well to be a beautiful piece. We didn't want it to be something that the customer would want to kind of hide away, put behind the sofa. We want it to be something that you want to put on show. And that's not just for the sake of arrogance, because putting it on show means you're much more likely to get it to where the rest of the speakers are, and that means you're much more likely to get it closer to the acoustic centre of the rest of your soundstage. So for lots of good reasons, we think we get a bass response which is well extended and is, is full and is controlled, but is also integrated correctly with what's happening from the bar, and that's fundamental to good performance. So that's the AV side of things. Let's move on to two channel. Let's move on to music. Mm -hmm. um, the first demo that I personally had was uh, down the stairs in the bedroom, mm -hmm. funnily enough, in this property. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the Wedge, and it's a, an all-in-one, but a stereo all-in-one. Yeah, exactly. So Wedge, if you like, is... You could view it as the kind of spiritual successor to the Zeppelin, the Zeppelin Wireless and so forth. It was um, in some ways related to that product, but it's, it's, if you like, it's that product on steroids. So uh, it's got more power, it's got a more sophisticated front end in terms of the brain, uh, the drive units are enhanced. It's using, again, the same 600 series tweeters as we use in the current generation of 600 series. So there's a couple double dome aluminium tweeter. Um, the form of it's really important. Uh, we did a lot of work, as you'll know in the past, I'm sure, with the Zeppelin to try and create that wide stereo image. It worked extremely well, but some of the feedback that we had was that some customers didn't like the fact that it was quite so wide. They found it quite difficult to put it onto a bookshelf. Well, what happens if you make something narrower? Inevitably, if you do that, you normally narrow down the width of the sound stage as well. So the form and the shape of the wedge is kind of an attempt to deal with that by carefully angling out the drive units. We're trying to still create that sense of space and openness in the sound stage, but not in a product that takes up as much space on the, on the shelf as the Zeppelin used to do. It's also got an angle this way as well, and again, that's deliberate too. A lot of these products are mounted at waist heights, perhaps in a bookshelf or a countertop in a kitchen or on the bookshelf downstairs in, in, the, in the bedroom, as you mentioned. And of course, that has the advantage of angling the drive units upwards, getting them pointing perhaps closer to where your ears are going to be. So we want it to sound big and room filling and spacious and to hopefully create an effective stereo image. That's the reason it is the shape that it is. We're going to come back to design, obviously, with the duo as well. But 
What was the thinking behind the design of the wedge? Because it is an unusual looking device. Very much so. Well, again, I mean, Bowser Wilkins is known for that, right? I mean, Zeppelin, I touched on just now, PV1 800s, let's be honest. So, I mean, we're known for being brave and for having the concept of form following function. So that's exactly the same with wedge. How can we create a reasonably small, reasonably small form factor design that can create a big room filling sound? So the angle drive units are obviously pivotal to that, as I touched on. Uh, that also allows us plenty of scope to incorporate FST technology, if you're familiar, the fixed suspension transducer, which we use in our 800 series, so the edgeless surround on the edge of the drive units, which creates a kind of more coherent and open sound from the mid-range, frees it again from the enclosure, kind of gets it out of the box. And of course, the last thing we're looking for is base extension, it's power, uh, and that requires a certain degree of acoustic volume, a certain degree of literage, I mean, e even when you're using an actively driven system. So having that degree of depth front to back and then mounting the subwoofer unit right in the heart of it means we avoid any unnecessary rocking of the enclosure as we're making the subwoofer operate. We can get a good amount of throw and excursion and extension because we've got plenty of space to make it do that within that design. So everything within the wedge, every part of how it is the way it is, is about trying to maximise acoustic performance. So let's move on to, I think, the star of the show. Um, certainly for me today, it's, I, I was actually blown away with the, with the audio quality on offer because um, they are absolutely stunning. Now, I have had comments on the forums that people think they're ugly. Mm. Actually seeing them in person and then seeing the design language compared to the 800 series, I think you've nailed it. I think they look really, really nice. Well, thank you so much, Ada. That's very kind of you to say. I mean, the, the interesting thing with that was it, it was a bit like um, a good analogy for us would be BMW with the i8, the car. How do you create something that kind of looks identifiably, recognisably something that belongs to a brand, in our case, Bowers and Wilkins, and at the same time, something that kind of signposts a future direction for us as a business? So we wanted it to be something that your members and anybody else in the store could see from 15 metres across the crowded shop floor and go, there's the new Bowers and Wilkins. It makes a lot of sense. At the same time, we also wanted it to be able to make a statement about what we think and about our future direction. So it's at once kind of identifiable and modern. It's got modern design detailing that's conscious. Uh, it doesn't have things like a cloth grill. It has the fixed grill mesh, which is about trying to state where we think we're going to go in the future. Because we know from previous work that we've done on, on modelling FEA and grills that we can put grills in place that don't overly compromise the acoustic performance and still make the products sort of safe from the point of view of kid interaction, etc., but also sound fine. So that's great. Um, and there's other clever stuff in the design as well, like the, the way that the, the cabinet is formed and what it's made from. I mean, it, you might think it's a curved wood cabinet. It's not. It's a polymer. Uh, it's been carefully constructed in such a way that it maximises the open area of the antennas, makes them work really, really well, maximises signal strength, um, but at the same time produces something that's structurally very strong. It's got internal matrix bracing. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with 800 series, you'll know all about that. So we're trying to control any unwanted resonances moving through that structure. Uh, make sure it's as quiet mechanically as can be. Acoustically, it's a very good form. Tweeter on top, you'll know all about that. You obviously just mentioned 800 series. That's, again, something that's familiar. So there's lots of classical, familiar Bowers and Wilkins tech, coupled to all the high-quality tech that we've just mentioned with, you know, with formation and the wireless platform and the wireless synchronisation speaker to speaker. And the other thing I find really interesting is what you can do from the point of view of it being an active speaker. So, of course, short signal path optimised drive unit behaviour to amplifier, dynamic EQ, full control over dynamic drive unit behaviour, all those sorts of things. So we can use the DSP, which is very powerful, to really optimise the performance. So I don't think we've ever made a speaker of any size close to this that has the ability in terms of low frequency extension that this does. And I think that's what impressed me the most was the, you know, the full frequency extension that, that is there. You know, you weren't cheating. They're not up against the wall. There's no port there for them to, to do it. It's all done digitally, which is and with the amplification on board, I think it's really, really clever. Certain companies, um, not I think the grown-up ones, uh, I'm going to count name audio as one of those, they don't play the kind of, the game name, you know, they, they don't kind of sort of go, oh, it's 5,000 watts, it's 6,000 watts, you know, they, they talk about real output and we're the same, we like to think we are, so it's a relatively modest thing if you're talking about numbers, it's 125 watts stereo per side, 250 watt total. Doesn't sound massive in the context of the 3,000, 5,000 watt amplifiers that some brands are using, but we think it's adequate. It's absolutely fine. And when well used and well deployed, like we've got here, um, and again, we really are working very hard to model how it behaves with the driving, you can do what you've just heard, which you can get fabulous dynamics, you can get fabulous extension, and it all sounds pretty effortless as well. I think that's also really important. You don't hear um, you might be familiar with this in digital products, you don't hear the compressors coming in, you don't hear the limiters coming in, you don't hear the system kind of softly trying to modulate what's happening. It's trying to deliver it as, as unfettered as it can be and just doing a really good job of doing it. So we've, we've spoken about all the products now apart from the audio. Mm -hmm.
So Formation Audio is, is like a, it's a, it's a two-function product. It fulfills two roles. The first thing it does, um, as you saw in your demonstration here today, is, well, you've just bought a shiny pair of wireless loudspeakers, or perhaps a single wireless loudspeaker, and then you want to get an older source that you might have in your home into that system. The last thing you want to do is trail a wire across the floor to that product. That would seem really odd, right? So the audio allows you to place that source locally wherever you want it to be, connect it via the shortest possible signal path using traditional methods, so digital or RCA analog into the audio, and then wirelessly transmit from there to the speakers. Now, of course, there are other systems out there that allow you to do that today. The issue is that the majority have some form of compromise in their acoustic performance, or they actually wind up rendering the thing kind of a poor facsimile of what it originally was. Uh, we deliberately chose a very warm sounding kind of vinyl friendly record, uh, a Gregory Porter kind of record, which has a very kind of delicious jazzy kind of blue note sort of sound to it, because we wanted you to be able to recognise that it sounded like a record, and that's a really important part. Um, you know, choosing a different recording wouldn't have got the same effect across. And we're taking that, don't forget, that analog record, we are clearly having to go through a process of converting it into the digital domain to wirelessly transmit it, but we believe we're doing it in a way that still preserves the essence of its character and makes it suddenly meaningful to have wireless transmission between, in this particular case, a record player and a pair of speakers. When are they going to be available and what's the pricing on them? Okay, so end of this week, uh, so in fact next Monday, the 29th, uh, all available to buy, uh, all in the public domain and launched uh, as of now, so that's fine. Um, uh, obviously a lot more to follow as well, let's be clear, but right now uh, the duos are available in the black and the white finish are 3499 for the pair. Uh, the wedge, which you heard downstairs in a light finish or a dark finish is 899. Uh, the audio, which you used or we used, pardon me, to transmit the records uh, to the duos uh, is 599. Uh, the bass, which is the subwoofer unit we mentioned earlier on, the dual opposed subwoofer, that's 899. And the bar is 999. One question is going to come back is, where's the expense? How is it so expensive? Um, is it in the materials that's being used? Is it the, the know-how that's behind the product? No, it's in the materials and the process. It's the combination of things. I mean, obviously, we'd like to think we're charging a premium for the know-how as well, but I think that's harder to quantify. Now, let's talk about um, what goes inside it. If you talk about the Duo, as an obvious example. So that's got the same tweeter as you get inside a 705 passive loudspeaker. It's got the same mid-bass cone as you get inside an 805 passive loudspeaker. It's got curved cabinet construction and matrix bracing like you find in an 805 passive loudspeaker. An 805 passive loudspeaker is £4,500 for a pair passive loudspeaker. And you still need to add the amplifier and the cable. Now I'm not for one moment saying anything against 805 because obviously I love 805 and also it has other things that this product doesn't have such as the diamond tweeter. So there are still very sensible reasons why the 805 exists. But I think if you were to talk about relative value for money Arguably, the Duo is a pretty relative, sensible value for money because, don't forget, you don't need to buy any speaker cable. You don't need to buy an amplifier. Arguably, you don't even need to buy a source, depending on how you choose to interact with your products. It's all there within the system. Just turn key and go. So, reasonably sensible. Some of the other ones the same. PV1D, uh, you know, dual opposed um, subwoofer, but require connection to other devices. Well, the base is a dual opposed subwoofer with a very sophisticated set of drive units and a kind of force cancellation configuration. Two very powerful magnets and motor systems. There's your money. Andy, fascinating products. Looking forward to hearing them uh, very soon for review and thanks very much for your time. Very welcome.